Hello, everyone. Welcome to the gathering room. Today, I have changed my backdrop by turning around because someone did look at my, I don't know, face place, Snapchat, whatever it is, and said to me, it's all one thing. It's just you sitting in front of, I don't know, it's like a screen or something. I was like, that's in my room. Where I, that's our writing room. Her writing happens. It is a precious room. And they were like, it's boring. It looks stupid. So I did turn my chair around, and now you can see my lemon tree. Ah. Ten people are with us already. Hello, gathering room peeps from all over the world. How you doing, Donna? Good to see you. Oh, yes, the backdrop, the lemon tree. Greetings from NY East Coast. Yay. It's my favorite place outside here. It's I call it my nature preserve. It's where all the animals come because I keep a fountain. And they all the animals come, the, the little animals come by day and the big animals come by night to drink. So I'm happy to have you here in the very same gathering room, but turned around. Hi, Tiffany. Hi, Kirsty. Hi, Tina. Hi, Kristen. Hi, Uma. So good to see you all. I'm very excited. When we get up to, this is my rule, when we get up to 100 people. From Washington, Trisha, how are you doing? Ah, Anne Marie, Julia, Trish, hi, Trish, uh, Elliot, the most beautiful poet. Julia Jones, how are you doing? So we're up to 74 already. In a few minutes, I'm going to start because I am excited. Hello, Teresa. Hello, Shannon and Joyce and Claire Louise, all the way from England. How are you doing? Uh, congratulations, England, on the big party going off well. That was good. Hi, Joyce from PA. P oh, we're up above 100. So I'm going to start. So today's topic was forgetting and remembering, and it comes from my reading of the Divine Comedy. If any of you are doing writing to light, you know that I follow Dante through the Inferno and then on into Purgatorio and Paradiso in that class. But it's also the, the narrative vehicle for the book I'm writing right now, The Integrity Cleanse. So I've been reading um, Dante's Divine Comedy very carefully and very repeatedly and being amazed by how well, his experience fits in with the patterns of enlightenment that you hear from Asia or from early Christian mysticism or even from modern people who've had awakening experiences. So he goes through the hell uh, part of his journey and he burns away the parts of himself that are attached to things that hold him back from heaven. That's not the part I want to talk about. Then... For those of you who don't know the story, Dante goes all the way through hell, pops out the other side, and goes on to purgatory, which is a Catholic thing. And purgatory means to purge. It's the place where people who don't want to be sinful figure out how to be good. And it's 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 hard and it's an effort, but it's a mountain that you climb. And the higher you get, the easier it gets. Now, here's the part I wanted to talk about. And I have never heard anyone mention this when they discuss the divine comedy but to me it was actually my very favorite part when he gets through with hiking up purgatory so he's worked out all his errors of thought there's one thing Dante has to do to enter paradise and that is that he has to bathe in a river and first he has to bathe in a side of the river that makes him forget all his sins all the bad things he did in his life and then he has to go to the other side of the river and bathing in that side of the river causes him to remember all the good things he ever did. And that's the step you have to take before you get into paradise. I absolutely love this because I don't know, because of Puritanism or human nature or whatever it may be, people always seem, from what I see, to remember the bad things we do and forget the good things. Like you can do a whole 
day of things really well. Like I told a story on Instagram how I went for a walk with my dog and we startled a, a hen wild turkey and she had about eight or 10 little chicks, tiny, tiny little chicks. They're the same size as baby chickens, only stripy with long necks. And I was delighted by this. And then I look around and my dog has a baby turkey in his mouth. And so I screamed, Belbo, drop that turkey. That's a sentence that you all say every day. And he did because, you know, our dogs, domestic dogs, they hunt and sometimes they're successful, but then they don't know what to do. It's like, I cut it. What now? <laughs> so he dropped it and the poor little thing was soggy, but I checked in its wings and its feet and its neck were all okay. But the mother turkey ran off. So I left my dogs by a fence and I climbed over the fence and I took the little turkey and I carried it all over going purr, 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 because that's the noise the mother turkeys make. And Believe it or not, after a few minutes, I heard coming out of the forest, purr, purr, and the mother is very cautiously coming out of the trees, and her little chicks are behind her going, tweet, tweet, tweet. and so I took the little chick, and I put him down very gently, and I said, purr, purr, and then I went away, and the mommy came, and I, I hope the baby, he was a little bit shaken up, I have to say, but he was okay, so then I went and checked, and they were all gone, so I think it's okay. Here's the thing, as I walked on from that, what I, I didn't know whether to feel good about finding the mother turkey and returning the baby, or whether I should feel bad about taking my dogs out and letting my dog get a baby turkey in the first place. And I actually tended toward feeling bad. That, oh yeah, look, I almost caused a tragedy instead of I saved a tragedy from happening. And I, so I was thinking about Dante and thinking how many of us who try to be good, it's, it's an interesting thing because people tend to do this more when they're trying to be good people than when they're sort of shiftless. We actually focus on what's negative and we forget all about the good we do. I saw this also when I, I go to Africa, people say to me, we're going to Africa in a couple of weeks. And people say, oh, but Africa is so scary and so many awful things happen there, which is true. It is absolutely true. But once you go there, you realize that for every horrible dehumanizing thing that happens in Africa on a given day, there are 50 million acts of kindness and self-sacrifice and graciousness and goodness and love. There's just so much love in Africa and you never hear that, right? So I think we tend to forget the good and focus on the bad as a way of trying to protect ourselves or whatever. And then I thought about the near-death experiences that I'm obsessed with. Elizabeth Kubler-Ross and her fellow researchers studied over 20,000 near-death experiences before she finally died. And it's interesting, in 20,000, we have this idea of heaven and hell. If you're good, you go to heaven. If you're bad, you go to hell. And most of us are bad. But in 20,000 near-death experiences, there were only two that said they had some sort of negativity or punishment. And both of those were probably hallucinatory, not real near-death experiences. Um, if you've read Proof of Heaven by Evan Alexander, the neurosurgeon, who had a very extensive um, experience when his brain was completely wiped out by meningitis, um, he had this hugely visionary time of it when his brain shouldn't have been working at all. And what he brought back were three, he brought back more than he could ever unpack, but he said he had three major things. You are, you are infinitely loved, you are always safe, and you cannot do this wrong. You can't do any of it wrong. It's almost like he had to bathe in the same two rivers. He forgot everything he'd done wrong because it isn't wrong. You don't take that with you. But then he remembered everything he did right. You're infinitely loved, you're always safe. So I thought we could just take a second, all of us, and notice if we have any negative thoughts about what we've done so far today. Just take today. Um, I have a few. And then try to remember anything positive we did today. So my negative would be that I lay on my back because I have a back issue today, and I watched some really stupid TV. I watched um, some comedians 
discussing the royal wedding. It was really not um, that value added, I have to say. It was not enlightened. And it wasn't even very funny. And I just sort of sat there and looked at it for an hour and a half. And I feel like, oh, I'll never get that time back. You know, I'm only on earth for a short time. I should have been getting something done. Then I look back and think, what are the good things I did today? Well, while we were, I watched that with my family. So a bunch of people and dogs all cuddling in our TV room. And really, I think, what else did I come to earth to take back except the memory of cuddling with my loved ones? Really, what is better than having a dog fall asleep on your tummy? Um, after almost killing a baby turkey. So maybe I did something good. And what about the fact that I made pancakes for my family this morning? I hadn't given that any thought. Um, what about the fact that I haven't, that I've tried to be kind all day? Hadn't thought about that. So obviously I did not have a very eventful day. But just the same, I can look back and I can try bathing in the river twice, forget Forget the self-blame, forget the criticism, drop it all, just forget it. And then remember all the positive, bring it really up, hold that in your mind. If there's one thing I've learned from life coaching all these years, it's that the thoughts we choose to hold in our minds are like the objects we, we choose to hold in our hands. Oh, Marianne says you rested your back. That is true. And if you have a bad back and you don't rest it, you're basically torturing an animal. Carol, Carol has not said the F word all day, which in my book could be bad or good. Depends on the context in which you say it. Um, anyway, congratulations. So the thoughts you hold in your mind, are, you, get, you get to choose them like the objects you hold in your hands and it changes everything. It's much more powerful than what you hold in your hands. So choose my whole thing now today is bathe in the river twice. Anytime you have a negative thought about yourself, choose to pick up a thought of something you did right. And that will cause your mind to be filled with it and put down the thoughts of what you did wrong. And I believe that this practice can become habitual. So this is, I'm gonna make a little commitment today to start doing this more. And I'd love it if you would jump in here with me too. So, um, oh, Donna took time for herself by entering the gathering room. I'm so glad you say that. It's such a happy thing for me. So I know you made at least one person very happy by doing that. And if you did it for yourself, that's two. And then everybody we interact with gets to be happier because we're happier. Oh, yes. Adriana says, it feels so good and to, to bathe in the river of forgetting and the river of remembering. I think the river of remembering is the key, you know? And I'm open to any questions now that you may have about this as a practice or as an idea or a comment about how it, how it works for you or how it's hard for you or whatever the truth may be. Oh my God, Anna said she hosted a play date for seven children under eight years old. I don't know if that counts as goodness or self torment. I mean, that, <laughs> but anyway, the rest of us didn't have to uh, deal with that play date. So that's a positive. <laughs> no, it's good. It's very good. Shannon's in. Shannon Beck, clearly a long lost relative. I rejected my ex's phone call in the middle of this. Way to go. Choosing. Liz Gilbert calls it curating her experience. She says she, and I've seen her do it. I was reading her this book called how not to write a novel, which is really funny. It's two editors who just, they write down all the silly things that bad writers do in novels. And I thought it was hilarious. And I started reading and they give examples that are very exaggerated. And I was like, Liz, listen to this, this is so funny. And after two or three sentences, she said, don't, I, I'm not letting that in. It is bad writing, it's funny, but I can't let bad writing into my brain right now. I have to write well. So I can only let good writing in, sorry. And she really curates her, hi Sarah, her, her own mind. Hi Sarah, she says, I wonder if forgetting is not as important as understanding. Hmm. Well, in the inferno, 
What Dante does is he goes up to every sinner in hell that draws his focus and he questions them until he understands why they're in hell. And they're always hanging on to something that's keeping them from moving forward. If they would let go of their beliefs and their fixations, they could move on to purgatory and paradise. And as soon as he understands why they're in hell, he's not caught in the same crime or sin or whatever you want to call it. I don't really believe in sin. But I do believe that if you understand why you're doing something wrong, it does you just automatically leave it behind you. It's fixated in hell, but you don't have to stay there. So that is a really important part that comes earlier in the process for me. And it is true. I've had people as clients who were doing things that were quite harmful and they were really happy to forget what they'd done wrong and remember what they'd done right. They'd be like, sure, I cheated on my spouse, but hey, I had the, the heart to lie about it. I must have heard that from a dozen people out of the thousands I've coached. And I always just drop my jaw. They're like, yes, I cheated, but I had the honor to lie. And I'm like, no, you're not. No, that's not going to help. If you're doing it that way from a place where you're excusing yourself for bad behavior, you won't be happy. It's that simple. But I don't think most of us here are that. I mean, you wouldn't be here if you were into that. You're here because you're trying your absolute darndest to be good. And for people who are like that, our failure mode is that we forget what we've done right and fixate on what we've done wrong. And we have to let go of that. Yeah. So um, Sarah said, understanding releases it. Yes, understanding releases. One condition, and I'll say it after I answer this question. Oh, Tracy's in the hospital. And she says her thoughts are in panic mode. She asks for one step back to peace that she can take. Oh, this is so great, Tracy. I'm so glad you're joining us. And I, whatever's wrong with your body, we're all pulling for you to be out of suffering and vibrant with health. And there is a really, there's a fascinating thing that I realized yesterday while I was walking along by myself. I realized that when we surrender to the reality of a situation when we surrender to being in pain and, and the fact that it may last forever, you say, okay, I'm gonna surrender to the, because I was in pain for so long and my back hurts now, so it's sort of coming up. If I accept that pain may last forever and I relax into that, it immediately starts to change. It doesn't always go away completely, but it, it immediately starts moving where before it was locked. But when I'm in pleasure and I try to hang on to it, it disappears, it evaporates under my, in my fingers. So I realized that when we resist the, the permanence of pain, let me phrase it like I did finally at the end of my walk. When we accept pain as lasting, it becomes more fleeting. And when we accept joy as fleeting, it becomes more lasting. So whatever pain you're in right now, Tracy, even if it's not going away, breathe in. And when you breathe out, drop your jaw just the slightest little bit. Like just relax your jaw. And there's a slight bit of pleasure that comes from the relaxation of the jaw. And it spreads across the face and sometimes down into the neck. So breathe in. When you breathe out, drop your jaw and feel that little release, little tiny release. Breathe in again and feel that your spine, it's almost like it, your torso fills up and it kind of, it inflates and then you breathe out and it collapses a little and there's a relaxation and there's pleasure in that. It goes up and down the spine and on the out the shoulders. It may be that you're in real pain, serious pain in another area of your body. But when you focus all your attention on the slight release of tension in your jaw or in your spine or in your shoulders, it's like you put the massive pain into the river of forgetting and you put the pleasure in your jaw into the stream of remembering. And you can begin to focus on what's going right rather than what's going wrong and then start listing things that are going right. 
And just you start to flood your body with the sense of everything's going right. Everything's going right. Everything's going right. And with every breath, you let yourself sink into that relaxation and you get a little bit of like a Skinnerian reward that, that rewards the behavior and then it brings it back, brings it back, brings it back. So that's what I used when I was hurting. And I hope you're not hurting, but anyone out there who's hurting in any way, that little exercise can be really powerful, weirdly powerful. You said you wanted to follow up on Sarah's. Oh, oh yes. I was going to follow up on Sarah's um, comment that does understanding our pain um, that lead to a release of the pain. And it does, but it has to be from the point of view of compassion. You can't do it like a mechanical, like I understand why A leads to B leads to C. It has to be, oh, and I remember what I was going to say. Um, once you understand, you do have to um, take some kind of action to make sure that the circumstance you have realized is painful becomes as relaxed as possible. So one of my favorite studies, well, groups of studies were called the Rat Park Experiments. And this was a, a guy who came back from Vietnam, became a psychologist, and noticed that a lot of his buddies from Vietnam were hooked on heroin. And the addiction problem was huge for Vietnam vets. He had also done a lot of heroin in Vietnam, but when he came back, he just stopped taking it. And he had flu-like symptoms for about a week and then he was fine. And he had many friends who actually did that. And he thought, well, why is this? That heroin is so addictive to some people and I just didn't have a problem. And he read all these studies about rats because rats are biologically similar to humans. And rats can be very addicted to heroin. And all these studies on rats showed that heroin was chemically addictive. But then this guy's name is Bruce Alexander. He said to himself, all these studies have one thing in common. They are keeping the rats in cages. And rats do not like cages. Just like 19 year old boys don't like being shot at in the mud. So he came back from Vietnam, he was out of a cage and he didn't want heroin anymore. So he took a bunch of heroin addicted rats and he put them in a huge enclosure called Rat Park that had all the things rats love most. Places to play and cuddle and reproduce and have picnics and whatever. And then he gave him a choice of plain water or water laced with heroin. And all the addicted rats stopped drinking the water with heroin and chose plain water. Even when he put sugar in the heroin water, which rats also love, they still would prefer the taste of plain water. They'd give up sugar in order to not get high. Then he took them back in their cages, gave them a choice, they went right back to heroin. They didn't like the cages. So once you have understood how you are keeping yourself in a cage, and that can be by clinging to uh, thoughts that you're bad or continuing to conform to social rules that don't work for you. Once you've realized that you're in a cage, I think it behooves us all to get out of the cages we're in. Like if the rules of your world keep you miserable, you won't be able to stop doing things to ease the pain until you're out of that situation. And that is the scariest thing for most of us is to leave the social situations that cause us to do dysfunctional things. But sometimes you actually have to do that. So that's the big exception. It's not just like, I understand, and now I can stay in my horrible job and my horrible life with my horrible partner or whatever and still feel good because I understand it. You have to make the changes you can. Yes. So Donna says, the forgetting process is frightening to me. To forget, I have to first name and remember. I've coped often by not attending to the painful, terrible things I've done. How do I get through the remembering to forget? Well, forgetting has to come first, but you're absolutely right. To forget, you have to name and remember. And that's just called taking accountability. That's what purgatorio is for in the Divine Comedy, which, by the way, I view as fiction, but I love it as a metaphor. First thing Dante has to do is 
sort of burn alive every place where he's connected to things like his like rage and you know uncontrollable rage or gluttony or greed or whatever. But then in after he goes through hell, most people don't even read the rest of the Divine Comedy. But he has to sort of stand, he, he goes up to all these souls in purgatory and every one of them also did bad things, but they're not in hell. And he says, what did you do? And they say, well, okay, so I was a drunk and I beat my children, but I know it's wrong. And by God, I'm gonna get, I'm gonna get past it. I am going to stop being that person. I'm going to reach a place where the pain in me that made me do those things is gone. But that, that step of owning, speaking it, and owning it, that's what people do in 12-step groups. That's what people do in therapy. That's what people do in interventions. That's what, it's, it's incredibly empowering, Donna. It's so strange that we fear and fear and fear what will happen to us when our secrets get out. But first of all, they're not secrets because we know them already. We're just in denial. Secondly, when, once you own them, they don't have any power over you anymore. If you, if you have no fear of knowing and having others know what you've done, you're completely free. I remember seeing this, you know, I was raised Mormon as a kid and any little thing you do, ooh, I, I drank a Coca-Cola, you sinner. You know, everything you do in Mormonism, it's really easy to sin, like wear the wrong underwear and it's a sin. Um, and in a way, that's really delightful because it's so easy to find out <laughs> what it's like to drop the idea that something is sinful. But I remember as a kid once watching this woman on someone else's television because we didn't have a TV. And to me, she was the ultimate in scandal. She had had affairs. She was she hung out with this rock group or something. She was a groupie and she was kind of famous herself. And this interviewer said, you know, there are rumors about you and you know, promiscuous sex and things like that. And she said, oh yeah, bring it. Like I've slept with every kind of person you can imagine. I mean, I just, I have no standards whatsoever. Next question. And there was, and like the audience was completely with her because she was, she wasn't excusing herself. She wasn't saying it was a really healthy thing to do, but it was what she'd done and she was fine with it. People told me I would be ashamed of having a son with Down syndrome which is a completely different brand of shame. But I realized that if I am fine with it, in fact, I'm proud of it, there's no shame in me. And I don't care if other people are going to shame me or not. So owning the things we're afraid to reveal is a really powerful way of getting past the fear of, of getting to the place where we can forget. So yeah, you guys are actually going through the inferno. It's interesting. So I wanted to start at the top, like right at the entrance to paradise. But what you guys are reminding all of us is that this process of burning away our attachments and then figuring ourselves out so that we can grow stronger and stronger and stronger. All of that is kind of a preface to getting to that place where at the end of our struggles, we bathe in the river of forgetting and then we bathe in the river of remembering. But I want to leave you with one thought. I want to go back to those Elizabeth Kubler-Ross 20,000 near-death experiences. And I want, you, if, I want you to know that if you died today, this is what I believe would happen based on that. If you died today, you would be met by an absolutely non-judgmental love that would show you your whole life and say, tell me about this. It's called the life review and it happens with a lot of people and this light, or sometimes it's a person comes and stands with them and they see their whole life spread out all at once, holistically. And what they're always shocked by is number one, the light isn't judging them. And it's actually encouraging them not to judge themselves. So it has absolute love. And the second thing is that it doesn't have the same priorities. It's more interested in the day you saved a turkey chick than it is in the day you got your Harvard PhD. It's more interested in the time you rested your back than in the time you went on television. It really, really is paying attention to how much we love. And it doesn't want us to fixate on our flaws 
And if you died today, you'd find out all the stuff you think is such a big problem is not a problem for love. And that what you're taking away from this life is like a jewel mine and you hack your way through a lot of slag and then you find these precious, precious jewels and you just leave the slag behind and on you go with all the jewels you came here to find. And that's why nobody has a negative experience after death. It's all acceptance. You're infinitely loved. You are always safe. You can't get it wrong. That's what I have to say. And I will see you guys next week right back here in the gathering room. Mwah, mwah, mwah. I love you.